Okay, so for this combined concept work example, we're going to look at the situation where we have two blocks connected by a rope um, and on this ramp. There is friction on the ramp in this example and you're given the angle with the vertical. Now, instead of just asking for acceleration and tension as a typical Newton's second law problem does, this one is saying after being released from rest, block M1 is accelerating downward and it's going to fall a distance L before it hits the ground. So M1 falls a distance L before it hits the ground and it's asking how long did that take? So it's asking for a time, which we have to use something other than Newton's second law to get because Newton's second law just gets us acceleration and it wants to know the tension. So how long did it take to fall and what was the tension in the rope? So one reason I picked this example was because when you had a similar one um, in the homework assignment, um, I noticed that there were some issues with solving the two equations and two variables um, for this type of system. So I thought it would be good to review that as well. So let's think about why this is combined concept. Again, because we need the time. If it was just acceleration and tension, then we could use Newton's second law all by itself. So our plan is that we're going to use Newton's second law, meaning follow all the steps with a Newton's second law. Um, and the goal of that is to get the acceleration of the system. So that's the acceleration of M2 and the acceleration of M1. They have the same acceleration and it's constant which means that in the second step, because we're going to look at just M1 going a distance L from rest, means that we're going to use 1D um, motion, and it's going to be with constant acceleration to get the time it takes to fall some distance L. So that's our general plan. And so now let's go ahead and execute it. So step one would be Newton's second law. And anytime I do Newton's second law, the first thing I do is count the number of objects with mass. So I have M1 and I have M2, which means I'm going to go through the steps of Newton's second law twice. I'm going to do it once for M1, I'm going to get equations of motion for M1. When I'm going to do it for M2, I'm going to get M2's equations of motion. So for M1, I look only at M1, and I'm going to go ahead and actually just change the color um, here so that we can keep M1 one color and then I'll do M2 another color. So I'll say here M1. First, I always draw my free body diagram. It has tension upward. It has M1G downward. When I'm dealing with two objects, I'm going to need to be very careful about my subscripts. This one is accelerating downward. I'm going to choose positive Y to be up just because again, I like to have my standard coordinate system. So that would be my free body diagram with my axes and my acceleration um, drawn near, but not on the diagram. Um, oops. Uh, and so now what I'm going to do is do the sum of forces in the y direction. I don't have x because um, for m1. And so that's going to be then the tension upward minus m1g down. And then that's going to be equal to negative ma because my acceleration is opposite my positive axis. And so that's going to be equal to negative m1, don't forget the m1, um, times a. I box that. Um, because I have a highlighter, I might as well highlight it as well. That is my equation of motion for m1. Now let's go ahead and change colors. Um, and let's write the equation for M2. Now M2 is going to be a little trickier because it's got a ramp, it's got friction. Um, so let's see what that's going to look like. So M2 here, I always sort of just draw my ramp in so I remember which way the ramp is. The normal force is always perpendicular to the ramp. The weight always points towards the center of the earth. Um, and then this has tension, always points along the rope away from the object, right? That's what ropes do. Ropes pull on things. They don't push on things. Um, and then it does have friction. And since this one is traveling up the ramp, friction in this case, it will be kinetic friction and it will be going down the ramp. So those are my forces acting on M2. I need to recognize it's going to be accelerating up the ramp because if M1 goes down, M2 goes up. So they have to move together as a system. Um, and then this is where um, so a lot of people, um, I'm in the minority, a lot of people like to take the positive axis to be up the ramp. Um, I just really, really like my positive, um, my right-handed coordinate system. 
And I like to show you that it really doesn't matter because you'll end up with the exact negative of what I have and an equivalent identical equation um, if you take positive up the ramp. So I'm going to take positive to be down the ramp. And so then this is my free body diagram with my axes and my acceleration. Um, and so now I need to do the sum of forces. And I'm going to start with the sum of forces in the y direction, just because I know because I'm dealing with friction, I am going to have to deal with um, the normal force. And that's where the sum of forces in y comes in, because I have no acceleration in y, so I can get my normal force. So if I write this out here, um, and this is from the ramp portion of, module, of this module, um, is n minus, um, and then it's going to be the component of the weight. And remember, um, in this problem, when you're given the angle, or just in general, when you're given the angle with the horizontal, then that means that's the angle I'm indicating here. In this problem, though, we're given 53 with the vertical, which means that normally I'm going to actually then say label this as phi. I would say like n minus, and then um, it would be mg cosine of my angle with the horizontal. And then it's not accelerating in the y direction. So it would be equal to ma would be 0. So that's equal to 0. Um, but here, I was actually going to say, again, phi would be the angle with the horizontal. So you can either choose to change 53 with the vertical, go 90 minus 53, and that'd be phi. So phi here would be 90 minus 53. Um, and so I, I could definitely do that. So I could say that phi is equal to 37, or I can use the sine of 53 instead of the cosine of 37. Your choice. Um, I'm going to stick with changing it to the horizontal. Um, I just, that's what um, I think makes most sense. It avoids the most errors, and you can just always be consistent that way. So what I get from this is that n minus mg cosine 37 equals zero, means that my normal force is equal to mg cosine 37. And so I'm going to just put a little squiggly line underneath that. It's not my equation of motion because it doesn't have acceleration in it, but it is useful information. Now I'm going to go ahead and do my sum of forces in the x direction. So the sum of forces, going back, if we look at our diagram now, the sum of forces in the x direction, I'm going to have Three. A lot of people forget about the component of the weight down the ramp. So I'm going to have a component of the weight, I'm going to have my friction, and I'm going to have my tension force. So in the tension force, because I've chose positive down the ramp, I'm going to write negative T. And this is where you'll see why some people like to take positive up the ramp. But again, doesn't matter. So T is in my negative direction, and then I'm going to say plus my friction force, so F sub K, and then plus the component of the weight down the ramp again, and it's, po it's positive for me because it points down the ramp, and that's my positive direction. So plus M2G sine of phi, so sine of 37. Some people have heard the saying sine down the incline. I told a couple people that um, already. So that would be um, the idea that the sine for the horizontal um, angle down the incline. All right, and so those are my three uh, forces. And then I have to decide whether that equals plus MA, minus MA, or zero. And if I look here, um, we can see that my acceleration is in my negative X direction. And this is then on my choice of axes. I, on the right-hand side, have to write negative M2A. If you chose positive up the axis, every single turn on both sides of this equation would be multiplied by negative 1, and you'd have an equivalent equation. All right, so we want to remember that F sub K is equal to mu sub K times N. We know what N is, so I can simply write this as negative T plus mu sub K mg cosine 37 plus M, and again, M2G, um, M2G sine of 37 is equal to negative M2A. And I am now going to box that equation because that is my equation of motion 
for M2. That is the entire goal of my Newton's second law part um, was um, doing those steps was to get this equation of motion. Um, and so now let's go ahead and rewrite this other one that we had found for um, M1 um, over here in purple. So we had seen T minus M1G equals negative M1A. I'm gonna just write that down um, here. So T minus M1G equals negative M1A. And I now have my two equations um, and two variables. The two unknowns in this are going to be tension and acceleration. So I'm not allowed to say acceleration equals and then have tension in my answer because it's unknown. So I need to eliminate these and solve for acceleration and tension with only the other quantities. Um, so the annotated worked example has this done um, in detail, but I'll go through it here again um, at the uh, request of some people and also just sort of seeing that a lot of people were struggling with this um, on the assignment. So one way that you can do this, you can solve your simultaneous equations however you like. One way that I do it is I will solve each one for tension and then set them equal to get each other to eliminate tension and then I can solve for acceleration. So um, that's a nice uh, little way to go about it. So I'm going to solve the first one for tension. So I'm going to move tension over to this side. So I'm going to say tension equals um, and then I will have um, over um, on the other side, I will have that tension is equal to M2A. It became positive because I moved it over. Um, and then plus uh, M2G sine 37 plus mu sub K M2G cosine 37. So that's the first equation. And then I'm going to solve the second one and we could see T is equal to M1G minus M1A. So now I can just equate these. And so I'm going to go through the process of writing this out again. M2A plus M2G sine 37 plus mu sub K M2G cosine 37 equals and then I'm going to set it equal to the other tension, M1G minus M1A, because my two tensions are equal to each other um, because it's the magnitude of the tension. So at this point, I have this equation, and some people would sort of, you know, try to solve this in, in different ways. Just remember that if you just put the term you're trying to solve for all on the same side of the equation, the acceleration, and then put everything else on the other side, it's going to make it a lot easier. Um, so now I'm going to move everything over here. So I'm going to move the M1A over. So M1A and then plus M2A. And I'll move everything without an A to the other side. So equals M1G and then minus these two terms. Um, and I'm going to rewrite these as M2G times um, and then sine of 37 plus, and I'm putting a plus because the minus is outside the parentheses, mu sub K cosine 37. And you don't have to rewrite it like that if you want. Um, if you don't want to, I just um, do. It makes it look a little bit more elegant. Um, and as physicists, we like that. Um, OK, so now I'm good because I can just factor this left-hand side. I can say M1 plus M2 times A equals. And then that's a notation I use to be like, oh, I don't want to write all that again. Um, and, uh, and so then I can just say A equals. And since this is my final answer, I actually will write it all again, M1G minus. M2G sine 37 plus mu sub K cosine 37 all over quantity M1, whoops, there's an eraser, um, M1 plus M2, nice box. See how acceleration is not in terms of tension anymore. I have acceleration, but there's no tension in it. Um, if you did this problem, you would have the same answer here, except for you would have nothing for the friction term. Mu sub k is essentially zero, um, but this would be what you should have gotten. Um, now it was also part of this problem asked for the tension. So let's get back to the problem we're trying to solve. The tension here um, is uh, going to be actually pretty easy to solve because we can go back over here and look at that one equation, take kind of the simplest one and say tension equals M1G minus M1A. Since we've already found A, we can do this nice trick where we can say where A 
is defined, or A, um, in this case, I'll just say A equals this. And that's it. So you can leave your answer like that. You do not have to write the big giant mess twice. It's already been defined once. As long as now I can say T, and if I had all these values, I could calculate a value for T without having A. Um, and I can evacuate A without having T. That's the key idea. So for step two, we're gonna do 1D motion with constant acceleration. And our goal there is that we want time. So we want the time for M1 to fall some distance L given that it started from rest. So V naught was equal to zero. It's not falling with acceleration equal to G. It's not in free fall. It's acceleration it was the A that we found previously. Um, so in this case, um, we can say here, you know, Y final equals Y initial plus VY initial T plus one half AY T squared. VY initial is zero because it starts from rest. Um, our acceleration is just the acceleration we found above. And then we're going to basically be able to see that if we solve this for time, then this ends up being um, equal, that t squared then would be equal to two times L divided by A. Um, and the square root of that would give us T. So two L over A um, for our answer for the time to fall. So the, this part was very short, right? It's the knowing to use this equation, knowing that this equation is 1D motion with constant acceleration, we're trying to find time, um, and then just applying it. And so this was an example of when a step can be very short. This is the time it took the mass to fall um, a distance L given an acceleration A. And we can check our limits. Again, you're like, well, we don't have numbers. I don't like this. This is where I was talking about checking the limits. If A gets really, really big, if A gets big, this gets small, right? So if A is big, if A is really large, then the time is very small, right? And if A is very small, then the time is very big. So that makes sense. So you can, you can verify results in this way. Um, so this would be a way to check the result. And so you can say this, and again, you can do the nice trick where A is defined above. And then you're done. So this was a long problem, but mainly um, because of the description that goes into that Newton's second law um, two-body problem. So that step took a long time. It's still just a two-step problem um, in terms of the big concepts we're applying, but that Newton's second law, two-body, finding the acceleration of that system um, is very involved. Okay, let me know if you have any questions.